recording started. Okay, today we're going to be talking about titrations. Okay, and titration analysis. Now, what are titrations? Well, this is the progressive addition of one chemical to another until the number of moles of each substance is equal. <clears throat> and that's very important to to understand that you are going to a, a place where the moles of each substance are equal uh, because that calculation is the calculation that gives you uh, information from the titration. If you don't calculate the number of moles that are required uh, you know, from your, your data, then it's not going to be very useful. Uh, and quite often when you're doing titrations, you're looking for an unknown. Okay, so you're standardizing, and this is also known as, as finding the concentration, or another term for finding the concentration of a solution by doing a titration. So let's say you have an unknown solution. You don't know its concentration in moles per liter. You know the volume. So if you can find out how many moles of some other substance uh, is required to react with it to, to get to an equivalence point, then you can calculate the number of, of moles of the or the concentration of your unknown solution using like a, a C1V1 equals C2V2 type of, of calculation. Now you can also plot your titration data and produce a titration curve. And this will show the change in the pH of the chemical that, that's in the Erlen Meyer flask as read by pH meter, as the amount of the other chemical um, is being added. Okay. Now you're going to have the the volume of the chemical in the burette. That's the manipulated variable, and is going to be plotted on the x-axis. And the pH of the chemical in the Erlenmeyer flask is the responding variable, and will be plotted on the y-axis. Um, now, there's also some other vocabulary terms that we want to learn with this, in that one substance, the titrant, is being carefully added to the other, the analyte, until the complete reaction has occurred. So the substance that's being added is being added from the burette. Okay, so the burette tube contains the titrant, which is the known concentration solution. And the, the solution that's in the Erlenmeyer flask is going to be the analyte that is our unknown. Okay, and the quantity of titrant required for a complete reaction is going to be measured by uh, using the burette. And then you do what's called the volumetric analysis. And this is a technique in which the volume of the material needed to react with the analyte is measured. So you measure how much. Um, solution was added from the burette tube until your equivalence point is met. Okay, so titrant, the substance added to the analyte. Uh, the analyte is substance being analyzed or your unknown and equivalence point. This is the point in a titration which uh, the quantity of titrant is exactly sufficient for the stoichiometric reaction with the analyte, which means that there's an equal number of moles okay that have reacted and the end point is a point in a titration at which there's a sudden change in the physical property such as the indicator color pH conductivity or absorbance and this can be used to measure the equivalence point so the end point and the equivalence point sometimes are you know exactly the same point but not necessarily uh, but the end point is always used to indicate or measure where the equivalence point is for the reaction. And an indicator is a compound that has uh, the physical property, usually color, that changes abruptly near the equivalence point of the chemical reaction. So let's take a look at um, one of these titration curves. And what you'll notice here is uh, you have your pH on the y-axis, the volume that's added from your burette tube okay and you'll notice that at a specific point you have this steep 
curve right here okay where the pH goes up um, you know drastically and this is a characteristic curve for strong acid and strong base which is the primary curves we'll be talking about for, for chemistry 20 okay now you'll notice that right in the middle sort of like the inflection point of this curve is your equivalence point all right or you could also say approximately in the middle of, of the steep section of the curve is your equivalence point which should be around seven for strong acid and strong base and this is going to be where the number of moles of um, acid is equal to the number of moles of base. Now, with the titration, there can be a titration error, which is the difference between the observed endpoint and the true equivalence point in a titration. So if I was going to do a calculation with a, a known concentration, um, you know, of, of the titrant, um, and a known concentration of the analyte, I could calculate, you know, exactly how much, what the volume should be. But there will be a difference between the experimental values and a, a calculated value, which is referred to as the true equivalence point. Now, blank titration is one in which a solution containing all the reagents except the analyte is titrated and the volume of titrant needed in the blank titration can then be subtracted from the volume uh, needed to titrate the unknown. Okay, um, so if you have a mixed solution you're going to want to do a blank titration. Okay, some other terms, primary standard uh, a reagent that's pure enough and stable enough to be used directly after weighing, then the entire mass is considered to be a pure reagent. And standardization is a process whereby the concentration of a reagent is determined by reaction with the known quantity of a second reagent. And so most titrations are, are actually a standardization of sorts. Now, a standard solution, on the other hand, is a solution whose composition is known by the virtue of the way it was made from a reagent of known purity or by virtue of its reaction with the known quantity of a, a standard reagent. So a standard solution, you can verify a couple of ways. Most of the time, you're going to be ordering, you know, let's say for hydrochloric acid, you get, uh, say, one molar hydrochloric acid from... A supplier and they guarantee it to be accurate to a certain degree of error or you actually get the solid hydrochloric acid crystals you know of a high molarity and but it's a no molarity and then you add um, you know water to it to dilute it to a, a known concentration value now a direct titration is one in which the analyte is treated with titrant and the volume of the titrant required for complete reaction is measured and direct titration is primarily what we're talking about. Okay, now the blank we already talked about. Uh, now titration trials, we're going to talk about this for a little bit. Um, when you're doing this experiment, you can't just do one trial. You need to do uh, a number of trials in order to get accurate results. So, when you have at least three tri trials and the results in those are all within a 0.2 millime milliliters, then you can say that you, you have uh, a good number of trials to base your, your values on. And you will use the average value of the volume um, to use for the stoichiometric calculation. Now, there are some titration problems. Um, you can have a reaction between two solutions, and one of the solutions, you know the concentration. The other solution is what you're solving for. Okay, so that's a pretty typical, uh, you know, problem question that you could be asked in connection with titrations. Or, 
you can know the volume of one of the substances because you measured it into the flask. Uh, and the other volume is going to be the average of the three best trials from the titration. Now, titration calculations rely heavily on the ability to perform stoichiometric calculations. So previously we, we looked at gravimetric calculations and solution calculations and gas uh, calculations and stoichiometry. But it's primarily the solution ones that you're going to be using with uh, titrations. Okay. So here's a titration calculation example. How many milligrams of oxalic acid dihydrate uh, will react with one milliliter of a 0 0.0273 molar seric sulfate if the reaction is as given in the reaction. So um, you want to take a look at your reactants and the oxalic acid here is reacting with the seric sulfate. Okay. And you can see the ratio between the, the seric and sulfate components um, and the oxalic acid is a one to two ratio. So that's what you're going to have to take into account. So first, you know, you're given a volume of, this, of the uh, seric sulfate and you're given concentration so you can calculate the number of moles. Now once you have the number of moles of the seric sulfate, you use a ratio, which is 2 to 1 ratio, so multiply by 2 basically, and find out the number of moles of the oxalic acid required. Okay, now once you find the, the number of moles, then you can use the equation, you know, m equals n times m, so your number of moles times the molar mass, which is given, and find out the mass. So the mass is going to be 6.88 milligrams. Okay, here is a different one. The calcium content of urine can be used to determine, or can be determined with the following procedure. Step one, calcium is precipitated as calcium oxalate in a basic solution. Step two, the precipitate is washed with ice cold water to remove free oxalate and the solvent is dissolved in acid, which is going to give you um, calcium ions and uh, mass in solution. Then you'll take your, your acid in solution um, and heat it and titrate it with the standardized potassium permanganate until the purple endpoint of the following reaction is observed. So you'll have your oxala, oxalic acid reacting with your permanganate in an acidic environment to produce water, carbon dioxide, and uh, magnesium ion. And there's going to be color change. Okay, so this could be the type of, of reaction that you're going to do in order to, um, say, determine the content of calcium in urine. So, you know, the lab tests that lab techs do on your blood and on your urine and stuff like that, they could be doing a titration reaction and, and do those types of calculations. Uh, you could have standardization reaction, okay, uh, to find out what is the molarity of one of the solutions. Uh, nitrogen analysis, uh, different types of, of questions you can do with titrations. Now, titration curves, you don't need to know this a whole bunch, but just to know the titration curve shape changes. If you're talking about strong acids and strong bases, uh, a weak acid with a strong base or a strong acid with a weak base. But for chemistry 20, you basically only have to worry about strong acid, strong base, where you have a pH at equivalence. Now note, uh, 
common indicator choice. The indicators, methyl red, bromothyl blue, phenylalanine, all fit your equivalence point uh, area. Okay, so they will change color around that pH. Now, if you're not sure what pH uh, an indicator changes color at, you can take a look at the chart, you know, in your data booklet, which states the different, some different indicators as well as uh, when they undergo a color change and, you know, what color to what color under what pH range. So, excuse me, that can be very useful. <clears throat> <coughs> now, titration curves typically exhibit three distinct regions for a single titrant reacting with a single analyt, and that is the, the part of the curve before the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, and after. Um, now, there's a few things we should know that the equivalence point is at is the steepest point of the curve as maximum slope and an inflection point. Now when we talk about inflection point, it means the curve starts going up like this and ends up going down. So you basically have an upward parabola and then a downward parabola and between the two parabolas you have an inflection point. Okay, or you have this S and where it changes direction is an inflection point. And that's an important point to know because that's going to be uh, right where your pH endpoint is. Okay, your equivalence point. Right there. Yeah, the boot. Now, for a strong acid and strong base, the curve is symmetric, usually pretty close to symmetric around the equivalence point. But for other, you know, reactions with the weak acid and strong base or, or uh, strong acid and weak base, your curves are going to be shifted. Okay. Now, another thing that you can note is that the less soluble the product, the sharper the curve around the equivalence point. All right, now uses of titration curves. You can take a look at the, the shape of the curve and determine what type of chemicals are being used, strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base. Um, you can also use it to determine if the chemicals are polyprotic or polybasic. <coughs> and this will be a curve with more than one abrupt change. Again, for, for chemistry 20, we don't really have to worry about the polyprotics right now. In 30 level, you will. Also, to determine the equivalence point, that's the main reason you're going to use a titration curve. Uh, and you can also use it to determine an appropriate indicator to use. So you'll pick an indicator whose endpoint closely matches the endpoint of a pH curve. And you should note the indicator's color change must um, occur completely on the vertical portion of the curve. All right, well, that concludes our discussion of um, titration and titration analysis. Once you have listened to this tutorial, make sure that you submit a tutorial summary to the Dropbox. Have a good day.